The role of father is one of the most important roles a man will ever have. To know that somebody looks to you and that you are their father. That they look to you for protection. They look to you for provision. That you provide and protect for them. That you are the one that goes before them in this world and in this life. And you set a course for them to follow. That you've figured out a lot of the things before they have to figure them out. And you've given them a good start. This role is a privilege because God describes himself as father. Having that title that God reveals himself to us as a father. That when people then hear about God and come to know God, that they should be able to look at their own father and say, I understand that God is the eternal supernatural version of this, that God cares for me like that, provides for me like that, protects me like that. It's going to be a very difficult role because it's a role that has to die to self, to put others before yourself. Your life really is for somebody else. That every day you get up, you go to work, and every day you're trying your best, and every day you're doing things that really and truly it's it's not for you, it's for someone else. And so one of the, the blessings we have in the church is that we have a knowledge of God our Father. And so when we're lost and we don't understand what to do, we can look to Him and say, that's what a Father is. The blessing of the church is that we have a Heavenly Father and through the Holy Spirit, God has risen up men who are fathers. And so we celebrate that, we support that and we protect it. Hi guys, hope everybody is well. We pray that you and your family are well. We thank you for joining with us. It's my privilege. Uh, this week we've got a special guest preacher, a homegrown pastor from the Wandsworth congregation. We've got Pastor Kudzi. He's at the moment pastoring in Merton. They, him and his wife are doing an amazing job there. They've been there for four years. And so he's going to kick off our series about fatherhood. And so open up your hearts. I'm really excited uh, about this message and we're going to be blessed. Amen. Hi guys, it's a great privilege to be here with you on this Sunday service, especially on a day like this, Father's Day. I want to say if you're a father out there, we salute you. We give you so much love and respect. Happy Father's Day. So today, as is Father's Day, I want to minister uh, on a sermon that I've entitled The Good Father. You see, the best news of my life and the most terrifying news of my life happen at the same time. I'm going to say it again. The best news of my life and the most terrifying news of my life was the same. I remember it like yesterday. My wife came to me and the way she kind of planned it, she, we were having a conversation and we needed some stuff. Then she was saying that we needed extra stuff. And I didn't understand why we needed extra stuff. So she says we need it for the baby. And here I am, I'm talking, I didn't catch it. And I said, wait a minute, what did you say? And she said, we need it for the baby. At that moment, I was so excited, I was overjoyed, I remember I gave her a hug, but in my mind, all of a sudden, terror took over. And the reason why I was terrified is because I couldn't answer this question. How am I going to be a good father? This was the question that was plaguing in my mind because I had never seen a good father. I had never been a good father. I'd never been around good fathers. And I was thinking to myself, how can I be a good father? I believe I'm not the only man. I believe every man goes through these. Every man thinks about these things. And I want to preach a sermon entitled, A Good Father, because God wants us to be a good father. So if you turn to Matthew chapter 3, verse 13 to 17, I'm going to read um, from there. The Bible says this, Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And are you coming to me? But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it be so for now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. 
When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven, saying, This is my Son, my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. I just want to quickly pray. Father, I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your mercy. I pray for this word today, Lord. My confidence is not in myself. It is in you. I pray, Lord, that you would minister to fathers today. I pray for the fatherless, Lord, that we would leave this place knowing that we have a father in you. Have your way today in Jesus' name. See, this text that we read is one of my favorite texts. It is very interesting in many ways, but why it's very interesting to me at this moment is this is the first time that we are introduced to Jesus, the man. If you think about it, in Matthew chapter 1 and Matthew chapter 2, all that is being referenced of Jesus is Jesus the baby. We hear about Jesus the baby who is prophesied to Mary and, and, and Joseph, and they're being told that they're going to have this baby and he's going to be a miraculous child. We hear about Jesus the baby. We hear about his birth in Bethlehem, how he's born in a manger, and all these wise men come from faraway places to show their respect and to give him gifts. All we hear about is Christ the baby. We hear about Herod and how Herod wants to kill this baby and how the family has to flee away and go to Egypt because they want to protect their child. All we hear about is the baby. But in Matthew chapter 3, we are introduced to Christ the man. The Bible says that Christ did not go to some big city to introduce himself. He could have gone anywhere in the world to say, I am here. But the Bible shows us that Christ goes to the River Jordan in the desert. He goes to a place where there is a man by the name of John, and John is baptizing people. John only did two things. His whole life was focused on preaching about repentance so that people turned to, to God. And the second thing was telling people about a coming Savior. This is all that John did. So on this fateful day, he sees Jesus coming towards him. He knows who Jesus is, and Jesus asks him the most ridiculous thing. He says, will you baptize me? John immediately is like, no, 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 that's too much for me. I can't baptize you. You should be baptizing me. And Jesus says these words. He says, no, 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 let it be fitting for us to fulfill righteousness. And all of a sudden, John baptizes him. Jesus gets baptized. The heavens open up and a voice comes from heaven. And God says, this is my son who I am well pleased. This is an amazing point in the gospel. Let me tell you why it's amazing. Let's strip away the fact that there's a baptism going on. Let's strip away the fact that it's John the Baptist. Let's forget that it's God who is speaking from heaven. Let's strip it down to its basic element. What is happening right now is a father and son moment. That's what we see. We see Jesus about to embark on a mission. After Jesus got baptized, he goes out and he finds the disciples. He begins to heal people. He makes that road. He begins that journey, that long journey to Calvary's cross where he's going to die on the cross for the sins of mankind so that many people can be saved. This is the event that sparked it all off. It's a father and son moment. The son is about to do something amazing. And guess who's there with him to cheer him on? His father. His father is like, no, this is my son who I am well pleased. It's a father and son moment. See, the sad thing about the generation that we live in today is very few people can look back and point to father and son moments. Very few women and men can look back at their lives and say, you know what? I've had some good moments with my father. We live in a fatherless generation. This is a generation where most people will look at their family albums and they'll see pictures of themselves as children. They'll see pictures of themselves at birthday parties with their relatives, with their cousins, with their mothers, with their aunties. But the father is nowhere to be seen. I remember about a year ago, a, a very, very good young sister in our church, very intelligent. I had the privilege to be invited to a school. And the reason why she wanted me to come to a school was because she was getting presented um, this prize, this great achievement that she was getting. So the school, what they do at the end of the term, they have this big celebration where all the children in the school who've achieved things, maybe it's in academics, it could be in sports, it could be in arts. And you've got all these kids, they come and they get presented with prizes. And I remember going to this event, 
her mom was there. And I remember just looking at what was happening. I was so excited. She kind of got this award for, for being the best in her class. And there were all these kids. Some of them were good at music. There was so much happening in that place. And I left there feeling like, wow, the future is bright. I remember seeing these kids with so much potential and so much ability. And I'm thinking, wow, this is the future of the world. But at the same time, I remember feeling sad. Because when I looked into the audience and the people who had come to see these kids and to cheer them on, there were very few fathers. You see, many fathers have robbed themselves of these father and child moments. Many children have been robbed with these father and children moments. You see, very few women out there can look back or look forward to having their father walk them down the aisle. Very few can say, listen, I can't wait until that day my father walks me down the aisle and gives me away at the altar. Because our generation has been robbed of father and child moments. And there is a problem with that. The problem with that is that it brings confusion. The reason why it brings confusion is because we have a generation that's growing up that, of men that don't know how to be a father and a generation of women that are growing up, and at the same time, they don't know what to expect of a father. That's a recipe, of a dis of disaster, a recipe for disaster. Imagine that. You, you, you are, you're grown up now. You're in a relationship. You're about to have a child like I was about to have a child. And the thing you're thinking to yourself is, I don't know how to be a father. I don't know what's expected of me as a father. This is something that is plaguing our generation from time in this time that we live in. See, the reality is there are many fathers out there. On a day like this, you can go out there and you'll find many men that have so many kids that have all of this. There's many, many fathers out there. But you know what's missing? There are very few fathers who know how to be good fathers. This is why I was so terrified. How do I become a good father? And I, I've got hope for you today. See, the Bible says, shows us that God wants us to be um, good fathers. You see, being a father is one of the greatest privileges or greatest title any man can hold. You can be a prime minister, you can be a CEO, you can be a king, but it will never compare to being a father. You know why? Because God says you can share that title with me. God wants every man to share that title with him. It's the greatest honor and privilege that we can have. So back to my story. Here I am. I'm, I'm worried now. How am I going to be a father? I don't know what to do. You know what I began to do? I began to read books. I began to read, listen to podcasts. I began to ask questions and speak to people. And I remember one man gave me the best advice, and I hold on to that advice today. I wrote it down. This is what he said. He said, godly parenting requires more than tips and techniques. It begins with knowing God. If you want to be a good father today, it's not about the techniques. It's not about the tips and things that you can do. It simply begins with knowing your father. You see, I want to close off with four ways that will help us to be good fathers. Four ways that we can be good fathers. Four ways that we can implement in our lives and that will help us to be good fathers. And we get these ways from the text that we have just read. The text that we have just read has a wealth of information and advice and, 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 and blessing about how we can be good fathers. And the first one is this. I'll read verse 16. It says, when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. The first way to be a good father is you have to be there. The Bible says that here at Jesus' pivotal moment in his ministry, his father was there. His father was right there by his side. Fathers today, we have to be there. This speaks of availability. So many fathers are busy making money and busy working and working all of these hours, and you're never around. You're never there to see your children. Your children are never there to see you. You come back, your children are sleeping. You leave the house, and your children are still sleeping. Fathers, we have to be there. God was there for his son. The second way to be a good father is you make your presence known and felt. In our text, it says that God opened up the heavens, and he begins to speak. And the Bible says that... Uh, 
it, the Spirit of God came in the form of a dove and he alighted upon Jesus. Jesus could not only know that his Father's presence was there, but he felt his Father's presence. This speaks of intentionality. You see, Father's it's no good just to be there, but we have to be present. We have to be present in these pivotal moments of our children. We have to make our presence known. The sad thing is that many fathers make their presence known in the wrong way. They make their presence known, maybe through abuse. They make their presence known simply by just being rejection or whatever way it is. But here in our text, we see the father making his presence known to his son in the right way. The third way, verse 17, and suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. You see, the father was willing to express his love to his son. You see, I grew up in a, in a time or in a generation where you never saw a father expressing his love to his child. Very rarely in the environment that I grew up would I see a father hugging his child or kissing his child. Very rarely will I hear a father say to his child or his son or his daughter, I love you. But here we see God. He's not ashamed of that. God is, is man enough to say to his son, this is my beloved son. I love him. God's love is, un, is, is unconditional. God's love is there and available for everyone. And fathers, we have, to, we have to adopt this approach that God has. God says, I love you. He's not ashamed to express his love towards his child. If only in this generation we had fathers who would express their love to their children. They won't have to go and look for love in the wrong places. You see, there's something that's happening in our generation. It's called father hunger where there's so many people that are growing up with a hunger for that word, I love you. As little children, they never got that love. Young girls never got that love, never got that assurance that they were loved. Young men never got that assurance that they were loved. So they begin to go out as they grow up. They go to gangs. They look for it in money. They look for it in relationships, but they never find it because that is a love that can only come from your father. And here in our text, we see God, the father, saying to his son, he loves, he loves him. If you and I want to be good fathers, we have to practice this. We have to express our love. I want to bring it to the fourth way. The fourth way is simple. He says, this is my beloved son who I am well pleased. This speaks of affirmation. He's affirming his son right there. He's saying, this is my son and I am pleased for him. Oh, how I wish fathers would give this affirmation to their children. You know, it's actually been proven that children that have affirmation in their life are actually more successful. They grow up to be more successful. I want you to think about Jesus. All that he had to face, he faced leaders, he faced kings, he faced soldiers and armies, he faced Pharisees, and never do we see Jesus backing down. We see Jesus living his life with confidence and boldness. Jesus wasn't ashamed to address issues that people wouldn't address. Jesus would go and say, listen, the way you're dealing with these Samaritans is not right. He would go and he would mingle with the tax collectors. He would go and he would heal on the Sabbath. He would do all of these radical things. He had a confidence. You know why? Because his father affirmed him. Because on this day when he got baptized, his father said to him, listen, you are my son and I am well pleased. If we're going to be good fathers, we need to adopt these things in our life. Number one, we need to be there. We need to make our presence felt and known. Number three, we need to express our love. And number four, we need to affirm our children. You see, we become good fathers by knowing the good father. This is basically what I've been trying to say all this time, that there is hope for this generation. Because the father is there waiting. He's there waiting to show us how to love our children. He's there waiting to teach the young man like myself who didn't know how to be a father, who had no reference point. The father is there saying, listen, I am here and I'm available. We can all know this father. How do we know the father? Why can we all know the father? Because Jesus got baptized. Have you ever wondered to yourself, why did Jesus get baptized? Baptism means a, a, a public confession that you have given your life to God or you've turned away from your sins and now you're following after him. This is what it is. Jesus didn't need to do that. 
Baptism is a symbol that you have died to your sin, and now you are alive in Christ. Jesus didn't need to do that. He was sinless. See, when Jesus got baptized, it was a symbol of what he was about to do. Jesus was symbolizing that he was going to lay his life down, and he was going to rise again. And any man or woman who would accept Christ as their Lord and Savior can be saved can live in that new resurrection. He was basically symbolizing what he was about to do. The Bible tells us that Jesus died on the cross. He died. Three days later, he was put in a tomb, and three days later, he rose again. And when Jesus rose again, we were free and able to have this relationship and enter into this relationship with God the Father. You see, before they would worship God from behind a veil, the Bible says that when Jesus died, that veil was ripped. I re let me read 1 Corinthians for you, for you. 2 Corinthians 6 verse 18, it says, I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. You see, because of what Jesus did, because he died and he laid his life down for us, we can now enter into relationship with this father. And this father can teach us to be good fathers. But listen, when we have a relationship with the father, we actually become better. That goes for any man or any woman. This is the amazing thing about having a great relationship with your Father in heaven, is that you can become better. There is hope for this generation. And on this Father's Day, let's celebrate our fathers. Let's tell them how much we love them. But let's take a moment to turn to our Father and say, you know what, I need to get to know you. Maybe you're not saved. You need to start to get to know him because you will never get better. You will never become the person that you need to be without knowing this good father. God bless you, that's all I have for you. I just wanna say a massive happy Father's Day to my daddy, a true superhero, a provider, a leader, and everyone's favorite bank account. I love you daddy, have a special day. Happy, happy Father's, Father's day. day. We wanted to say happy Father's Day and that we appreciate you very much. I want to say thank you to three special people and thank God for my dad who loves to take care of me and two great granddads who love to spend time with me and make sure I try my best. Happy Father's Day to you three. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. <laughs> Happy Father's Day, babe. I just want to say thank you for being a wonderful father to Havana. The way you love her it brings me joy and i know god's just doing great things in you and showing you the way to fatherhood you say bye 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 happy father's day dad i love you so much thank you for your support and um, listen your face banging yeah <laughs> happy father's day daddy happy father's day daddy happy father's day to our dad Father. We wish happy Father's Day to all the other fathers. To my daddy, thank you for all that you do for me. I love you very much and I wish you happy Father's Day. Love Naomi. Happy Father's Day dad. Thank you for being great. Thank you for building me up into the man I am today. We love you. Happy Father's Day daddy. How are you saying it as well for you? Happy Father's Day. <laughs> Hopefully this message was encouraging to you and you got something out of it. There may be some of you that you heard it and you realise that you're not right with God. You're not a Christian. You do not have Jesus in your life, but you want to. I want to lead you in a prayer. And if you say these words from your heart unto God, we really do believe that God will hear it. It's not the words that save you, but the words express what's going on in your heart. And so if you say, Lord Jesus, Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. Forgive me of my sins. Come into my life. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Help me to live for you the rest of my life. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, we believe that God heard you and that God is starting a new life inside of you and giving you a new hope and a new joy. And so if you did, please, there is a link underneath the video on our website. Let us know so that we can get some 
uh, resources out to you. And we're going to pray for you and believe God that you're going to grow in your faith. Also, if you want to be a part of one of our connect groups, there's also a link under our, uh, the video on our website. Uh, you can click on that and it can put you in touch with one of our leaders that would be ready to connect with you and so that you can get involved in that. I want to say a big thanks to everybody, part of our church and out there in the online community who are sharing these messages. This is the thing that excites us the most because we're seeing more and more people come to faith and more and more people receive the word of God. And that's what we really do believe is hope. And also I want to say a big thanks to everyone who's faithfully giving. Uh, week in, week out, we say this and we really do need it and we appreciate it and you make it happen. Uh, we understand why people give. They give because they believe the Bible and they believe God when he tells us that God loves a cheerful giver. And so thank you. Keep praying for us. Keep supporting us and keep sending out the material. God bless you.